My name is Amashi Kalor and I am the Marketing and Care Manager with the PSOJ. This forum today is our PSOJ Roadmap 2.0 forum that's entitled the Data Protection Act and Your Business. This is a very hot topic and we thought it was important to ensure that our membership is exposed to the experts in the field that can really guide them along to let them know the importance of it, the implications and what they need to do. We have an esteemed batch of panelists today. They are very excited to present to you. And so we are going to get the ball rolling at this time. However, I want to share with you that at the PSOJ, we have some specific committees and it's through these committees that we do a bit of our work. So whether it's advocacy, awareness, etc. And at this time, I would like to welcome the chair of our Innovation and Digital Transformation Committee, Mr. Chris Record, Christopher Record, and he's going to let you know, listen, what this committee is about, what are some of the areas that we've been talking about that we're going to be championing or advocating around for this year. So, Mr. Record, hello and good morning. How are you? Hello and good morning, Amashika. Um, I am doing, I personally am doing well. Um, Chuck knows why I say that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction and thanks folks for being here this morning. So the PSOJ's Innovation and Digital Transformation Committees, the main goal of the committees is uh, to focus on the current and emerging digital practices with relate uh, that, that will help uh, Jamaica, public and private, um, increase efficiency and productivity. So that's, uh, that's a broad, broad umbrella area. And so one of, the first, one of the first big digital topics that we were asked to you know, opine on, talk about was around our national identification. And so you know, the, the, the committee pulls together experts from, from the industry, whether it's through you know, Jamaica Digital and Technology, uh, Technology and Digital Services Alliance, whether it's from other government organizations, private sector organizations, to opine on these things, and then, uh, you know, for example, recently we 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 made an, an opinion uh, to a joint select committee around um, various uh, topics, such as even with this specific data protection act, and also uh, the upcoming discussion around the um, cyber crimes uh, cyber crimes act. So, in 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 these situations, the committee. Uh, again, pulls from its membership, folks who are interested in advancing digital uh, around these areas. Uh, recently, we were, one of our members put forth some discussions around a topic, um, the smart cities topic on our own, should, should the PSOJ uh, use its advocacy position in promoting anything around smart cities. So those are one of the things, those are some of the things that we debate and discuss um, in, this, in this area. One of the major areas that we assisted last year was around the delivery systems while we were country was under its um its various its various curfews and um, pr protocols around COVID, where we pulled together a bunch of members and created, uh, conceptualized, and delivered something called ENDS, which uh, allowed folks to be able to uh, order, um, get delivery, um, have permission for their staff to be on the road during that time. So this is just some of the work that the committee has been doing. And of course, uh, the, the the foundational work uh, again, it's all digital and anything digital. We right? need to make sure that people's private data is in fact protected. So this topic and this discussion is is extremely important at this time, and we're happy to have um, our newly uh, well, not that new anymore, but appointed commissioner. Uh, December one was our first day in the job, and a, a number of other attorneys to have discussion on this matter. So Amo. Thank you very much for uh, hosting this and um, thanks to the PSOJ for using this as one of our first topics um, you know, under the umbrella of the Innovation and Digital Transformation Committee for the membership. Thank you very much and let's get ready to rumble. Let's get ready to rumble indeed, Chris. And you are right, this is our first Roadmap 2.0 forum for the year 2022 and we're very excited. Um, you know, I hope everyone, all of you had heard his um, when he said that last year, one of his greatest achievements through the committee was the work done with the e-commerce national delivery solution. And that's, you know, it came at a time where the nation needed an answer. There was a problem, the nation needed an answer. And this was one thing that was put forward. We brought the best minds in very technical spaces to come together 
and make something happen. And that's the, that's the kind of thing we love here at the PSOJ. Action, as our president would say, advocacy to action. Right now we have the lady of the hour, the lady that everybody wants to speak to, Miss Celia Barclay. She is our first, Jamaica's first information commissioner. And we thought it was very important to include her in this type of fora because she will be very integral going forward with every kind of business, large, small, micro, you name it, Celia is gonna be on top of it. So Celia, without further, further ado, I would like to bring you to the fore so we can get to know a little bit more about you, the importance of your role and what you will be doing in the context of the Data Protection Act. Celia, good morning. Good morning, Amashik, and good morning to everyone present, our panelists and attendees. So the first question to you, Celia, is what is the role of an information commissioner? Are you like a minister? Are you like a judge? What are you really? The information commissioner is certainly not like a minister and not really like a judge either. The role of the commissioner is to ensure that persons right to the privacy of their personal data is protected. And by that, we mean that the provisions that are set out in the Data Protection Act to ensure that protection are maintained, inclusive of certain standards that have been imposed. So one of the key things that our office will do is to register as well as to monitor data controllers that are operating within Jamaica or whose operations in terms of data processing affect Jamaican citizens and their information. So we will monitor and regulate that, particularly in terms of carrying out any necessary enforcement activities in the event that there is any kind of contravention of those provisions. All right, monitoring, you're looking at enforcement. Those are some very big things. And a lot of people feel like sometimes we have committees, we have task force, we have all these things set up and we're not able to really keep the proper checks and balances in place. So tell me, how exactly is your office going to do that in terms of monitoring and enforcing all right, so there are several things that the information commissioner is empowered to do. So you can't monitor what you don't know about. And so the first thing the act does is to provide for the commissioner to register controllers. So the act has given a definition as to who constitutes a data controller, and then it allows for the information commissioner to keep a register of all these controllers. So essentially, this will enable us to know who is processing what type of information and in what way. And then we are now able to make necessary checks depending on the situation to see whether or not they are being compliant. In addition, the, the information commissioner will carry out assessments. So it is possible for us at the request of a data controller to come in, make an assessment as to what your processes are, whether or not you are operating in a way that is compliant with the legislation, and of course, assist you if you are not in becoming compliant by giving the necessary directives. But it's not just the controller who is able to make this request. Any person who believes that their rights might be being trespassed on, any person who is of the view that a data controller is not compliant with legislation can make a request to the commissioner to do an assessment and determine whether or not there's a contravention that is taking place. But in addition to this, controllers under the act are required themselves to carry out and submit to the commissioner's office an annual data privacy impact assessment. And so this is what will allow us to know exactly where different controllers are in terms of compliance in relation to their different data processing activities. Well, that is quite a bit of a mouthful, but I want to ask, because you say, you know, you will carry out assessment from time to time. Will that come at a cost or is it that we just want a waiting list for that type of work to be done? All right. So the Act provides for the controller to request an assessment. Where a controller makes the request, then a fee, of course, will be charged. That has not yet been determined, but once the regulations are promulgated, then persons will be advised as to how much the cost is. All right. Another thing we want to be clear on, when exactly does the act take effect? Because it was a gazette, but we want to know, you know, by when is game time or, you know, this is no more joke or no more talk. 
This is a very good question because it has been a concern for several persons that has been raised with the office. So the first gazette publishing an appointed day notice was published on the 30th of November, 2021. And that gazette stipulated that certain sections of the act came into force as at December 1, 2021, when I took office. However, it is important to point out to individuals that section 76 of the legislation provides for a transitional period. That's a period of two years within which data controllers are required to take the necessary steps to get themselves compliant. And during that two years, they may not be prosecuted for breaches under the act. However, please note that even though section 76 was not specifically mentioned in the Gazette, the section itself is very clear insofar as it expressly states that it comes from the earliest appointed date under the act. So there are several appointed dates that, is, that are provided for in section two, which may come in relation to different, different provisions and types of data, but the earliest of all appointment dates under the legislation is the 1st of December, 2021. So two years from that, mean at the end of November 30, 2023, all data controllers are expected to be in compliance. And at that point, our full regulatory role is expected to also take effect. I know we are going to be waiting for the question and answer, but because it's coming in, as you mentioned it, about the annual data privacy impact assessment, is there a particular form and way, like a prescribed form and way that this should be submitted to your office or that, or we should just wait for that to come out? The intention is for there to be a prescribed form. And so again, once the regulations are promulgated, persons will be able to see and know what exactly they are required to provide in terms of that document. Okay, so you mentioned that there's some further regulations that we're waiting on. Can you give us a timeline as to when these updates will happen? or be shared with the public? The process has started for the drafting of the regulations and it is anticipated that those regulations will come into being within the first year of the Act. So by the end of this year, we expect to have the regulations in force and supporting the Act. All right, you know, sometimes, and I'll you know, liken this to, for example, the Consumer's Affairs Commission or even Bureau of Standard. If I go somewhere and I, as a customer, feel like my data um, privacy rights have been breached. Where do I make a complaint? Do I go to the police or should I go directly to your office? What should I do if I feel like, you know, that there's a violation of some sort? Well, our role is to ensure that your rights are being upheld. So it is the office's responsibility to take the necessary steps to prevent any breaches and if there's a breach to act on it. So of course, a data subject who feels that something has gone wrong somewhere and wishes to have it looked at, can of course make a report to our office. However, please note that under the legislation, the primary responsibility in terms of compliance and respecting data subjects' rights is on the data controller. They have a duty to uphold your rights. And so we ask that data subjects, if it is that you have a concern, that you raise it first and foremost with your data controller, where they have a data protection officer appointed, then section 20 actually makes it one of the duties of that protection officer to ensure that data subjects are able to exercise their rights. And so you can contact the data controller, bring your concerns to them through the data protection officer, and they have a responsibility to address those concerns, whether to respond to you as to whether or not there is a legitimate concern or to let you know if there is what steps they have taken or will take to address it. Naturally, if you are not satisfied with the response or if a data controller chooses to be unresponsive, then by all means, a subject can make a report to our office and then we will investigate and take the matter further. Do you personally think that you will be empowered to act in a way that is just and in the interest of individuals of Jamaica or there's more work to be done on the Data Protection Act? The Act does give relatively far-reaching powers in terms of allowing us to conduct enforcement. But one of the things that we would like to focus on is the fact that there will naturally be numerous cases of breach in terms of our ability, for example, to, to prosecute every single case that comes up. 
I don't think there is any organization in any country that is in a position to do that. But what we recommend and what we certainly seek to do is to have the full buy-in of controllers into the regime and into the system so that they can help us to resolve the problems. Now, the Act also looks at allowing the commissioner in certain circumstances to appoint a mediator to help to address some situations. So that will help to minimize the workload in terms of matters that may, for example, need to be prosecuted through the court. And so we hope that by utilizing that system as well, we are able certainly to do much more in terms of our reach. So it's one thing for the private sector to know that you know, this Data Protection Act is gonna implicate all of us, but in terms of the government, is the government going um, having sensitization and training sessions as well to be compliant? Very much so. And I am quite pleased at the rate of take up in terms of the public sector. Um, I can say from my office's perspective that several organizations of the government have reached out to us. They have looked at the act and they fully recognize that all public authorities under the act are required to comply and are required to appoint a data protection officer. So they have been taking steps to make themselves aware of what their legal obligations are, as well as what technical assistance they may need in terms of bringing themselves compliant. And already we have organizations within the government that are looking at themselves and their structure and trying to determine as to who would be an appropriate officer for them to appoint as a data protection officer. I'll mention that one of the concerns that has been raised, which is natural is in terms of the limitations regarding the budget and how exactly you pay for these services, whether it is that you are now going to be adding an additional member of staff in order to perform this role, and how is the government overall going to finance the cost. Mm -hmm. And so that is feeding into and will inform consultations that we have in terms of what arrangements can be made whether for individual government entities, groups of evidence of entities, sorry, or even a whole government approach in terms of the provision of that services. But outside of those discussions, certainly individual entities have been taking steps to get sensitized, whether through my office or through the use of privacy practitioners and ensure that they're duly informed in how to go about becoming compliant. All right, so I know we in the PSOJ have a batch of esteemed attorneys that can help with our membership but will your office be producing like a list of you know the verifiable attorneys that are experts in the field that could also help to guide people on this journey what we have been seeking to do and our role is to inform the public as much as possible regarding matters concerning data protection we would not specifically recommend or refer individuals to any particular practitioner but of course, insofar as we recognize that there's a need for advice, assistance, and guidance to persons to become compliant, and that there are persons practicing in this space, we are trying in response to requests from several controllers to ascertain the details in terms of names, addresses, and services offered by the various practitioners, and certainly we'll be making that available to individuals in the very near future. All right, and then if I don't see another question coming, I'm just gonna pose this one to you as we wrap. Um, in terms of who needs to register with, the, with your office or who um, will be you know, liable under the Data Protection Act? If I am just a small, you know, I just have a small little online business, I'm not a big financial institution, does it affect me as well? It does, and I'm pleased to say that this act is in that way non-discriminatory. So whether you are a small man or you are a large enterprise, the act treats everybody fairly in terms of the rights and obligations. And so the big man to the little man has the same duty in terms of compliance. So the persons who need to register are anybody that fits the description of a data controller. And when you look at that description, you realize that if it is that you are the person who determines what in personal information is processed and how that information is processed, even if you're utilizing an external third party, such as a data processor to do it on your behalf, then you would count as a data controller and be obligated to register. 
a question came in. Do businesses, well, are businesses obligated to declare who their data controller or data protection officer is to the public? Like, should that be something that's now listed on their website or in, you know, informed to the public? Anyone who is a data controller and required to register under the Act is required to not just appoint the data protection officer, but to make it known. And this is because, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the role of the data protection officer, it specifically says that that person is supposed to assist data subjects in exercising their rights. Now, the only way they can really do that is if they're fully aware as to who they can reach out to in the event that there's a situation. And this is one of the reasons that in the registration particulars that are required on the legislation, you have to state exactly who the person is and further provide their name, location and contact information. So it will be available, whether through the controller or through our office. And so we encourage controllers to make the information public so that there's easy access to the persons who need it. All right, another question here. In terms of forms that will need to be submitted to your office, will this be an annual thing? You know, which ones do you foresee, foresee being annual mandatory filings with your office? The data privacy impact assessment for sure will be an annual filing that is provided by the legislation. So that's one right now for sure? Yes. All right. Okay, and if there are no other questions to Celia Barkley or first information commissioner, um, Stila, is there any other point that you'd like to leave with us this morning? Because I'm sure we'll have some more forums going on <laughs> this year, but is there any other you, point you'd like to leave? You had actually mentioned a question, which I just realized I had not responded to. The second part of your question was as it relates to who is liable under the legislation. Now, the controller bears the responsibility for compliance under the legislation. It makes the duties and responsibilities for upholding the standards and ensuring the exercise of the data subjects rights strictly at the feet of the controller. And so even though you may appoint a data protection officer, or even though you might be utilizing a data processor, the responsibility is yours to ensure that all the provisions of the legislation are complied with. And so in the event that there's liability, that's the first person or place to whom we will look, the controller. There's something about the time frame of reporting as well. Yes. Well, there's a duty on the controller in the event that they have in some way breached a provision of the legislation, or particularly we have heard situations of entities being hacked. If it is that there is a contravention, and particularly where you know or ought to know that this may have some substantial effect on data subjects, then you have a responsibility under the Act to ensure that within 72 hours of you knowing about it or it occurring, you report it to our office. All right, Ms. Barclay, okay, one more. What happens, okay, let's start here. Does the data protection officer have to be located in Jamaica? There's no express provision in the legislation that speaks to the location having to be in Jamaica. What controllers have to be very mindful of, however, is where they locate the person elsewhere or outside their office, if the person will still be able to effectively and efficiently perform their functions. Because you realize that in terms of being able to assist the data controller in complying, they have to be able to monitor the necessary processes. And so there's a certain level of access that is required to the business, to the information, to the processes in order for them to do that. So controllers will have to know what kind of arrangement they will be able to put in place to enable the person to properly perform their function if they're not here. All right, so we're gonna be wrapping up with the information commissioner, but I'm gonna pose this last question to you and for the others, we've put there to work quickly. In other jurisdictions, data controllers enter into operational agreements with processors, and these include indemnity of the controller by the processor. How will these be treated in Jamaica for liability purposes? All right, so remember now that you are looking at different aspects of legal obligations. So the controller will have a duty and responsibility under the law 
to uphold the provisions of the legislation. If they seek to use a third party, for example, as a processor, and in that arrangement, they have an indemnity, then note that that is a personal or direct right as between two entities or, in, or persons. And so while they may be able to recover from the data processor in the event of a breach, in terms of the imposition, for example, of a fine, if it is that the controller is found to be in breach, then they will be liable to pay the fine. And so it's for them to then go ahead and recover against the person who has provided them with the indemnity. All right. There was a question that came in about, you know, the sensitization. And I just want to just say to that person that the information commissioner has been on a, a blitz pretty much nonstop in terms of trying to sensitize people about the data protection act, but you can always reach out to her office for additional information. Another question that came in was, should the data controller be a full-time position with entities? The data controller or the data protection officer? Well, the data protection officer, no. Well, yeah, within, an, within a company, should it be a full-time position? But there's no stipulation for that. The act requires you to appoint one and once appointed their role in terms of their obligations and responsibilities will certainly be permanent and full time. But as to how you engage that person, that is for each controller to determine. So what is important again, is that the person is able to perform the different responsibilities that they have. So for example, if you opt to make this a uh, an external person, or if you have to make it a part-time person, then the question you will have to ask yourself is, in the event that a data subject, for example, wishes to exercise their rights, whether in terms of making requests for information or complaint about a breach, how do they go about doing that? How do they access this individual to get the necessary assistance from them and from the controller through them? All right, awesome. We're going to have to leave it there uh, with Miss Celia Barclay. Celia, thank you so much for joining us this morning, um, providing us with so much rich information. I know a lot of people had a lot of questions coming in and, and for the ones that we didn't get to answer, we'll post them to Celia for her to return a response. But Celia, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, I'm happy that we're seeing the questions come in like rapid fire. Everybody is all geared up and excited about this forum. So now we're going to get into our panel discussion and we have a few very well-respected and senior attorneys that are joining us today to really give us some rich data and rich information. We're going to start off with Miss Georgia Gibson Henlin. She, well, when you say esteemed, you know, she is <laughs> imminent of the highest. So Miss Celia, sorry, Miss Georgia Gibson Henley is a Queen's Counsel at the Jamaica Bar. She's also called to the bar in Ontario, Canada and New York in the United States of America. She's currently the managing partner in her law firm, the Henley Gibson, Henley Gibson and Henley, which is located in Kingston. She's a graduate of the University of the West Indies Mono campus, as well as Cape Hill campuses. She also graduated from the Norman Manley law school and the University of Toronto in Canada, where she completed her master's in 2002 in innovation law and policy. She is a current member of the Jamaica Bar Association, a member of the International, the International Bar Association, and also a member of the American Bar Association, the New York Bar Association, the International Trademarks Association, and the International Technology Law Association. Miss. Gibson Henlin, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. So with you being QC, I also want to touch a little bit on your certification in this area because it's not just to be an attorney has, you know, read the Data Protection Act and that sort of thing, but you have some quality, a little bit more qualification in this area. Could you break that down a little bit for me? Okay, I'm very happy that you asked that question because earlier when you spoke of um, attorneys being here and so on, if for, for persons who were on earlier, they would have heard Chuck and I joking about what we ought to be referred to as in fora such as this, because 
although the it, it is an easy transition for attorneys at law to become privacy practitioners or and, and to implement um, privacy programs, but you don't have to be an attorney at law. Part of your team probably should have an attorney at law, but the privacy profession is an emerging one, well, certainly for Jamaica, but world over, there is actually a whole field of private practitioners, which includes persons who have backgrounds um, as engineers and so on. So um, I think it's very important to, to, to know that so that people appreciate that they can have um, a wide pool of persons from which to choose. Uh, the other thing about being a private, private practitioner as well, there are actually associations um, yeah, globally. I think Chuck belongs to a different one from the one that I am in. So I am in the International Association of Privacy Professionals and I'm actually the, the co-chair of the first Caribbean Knowledge Net chapter for the International Association of Privacy Professionals and they are not just attorneys. So that's very important to say. So that is why I have CIPPE, which means Certified Information Privacy Professional. The slash is because I've specialized in the area of um, the GDPR. You can specialize in the Canadian version where you would see a C. There is the US version where you'd see US. And there are some other versions which probably we do not necessarily need to be concerned with, but to the extent that the GDPR is the gold standard, you will see most persons with that slash E. CIPM. CIPM is a certified information privacy manager. So that clearly sets me apart from being Queen's Counselor Gibson Henlin. Queen's Counselor Gibson Henlin is an attorney at law who practices litigation in the court. But with, with CIPM, I'm equipped to, um, and anyone with the CIPM and similar qualifications um, are equipped to assist organizations with the compliance with their privacy program. So it's very important for the members to understand that, to look out for those credentials. And I think Chuck may be able to um, add to that because as I say, he has a different credential, but it does the same thing. I will touch base with Chuck in a moment. So I want to start with a little bit of current affairs. Now, a few weeks ago, front page on the Gleaner, you know, the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, it was being alleged that they were selling voter information or access to voter information. Can you just break down what was happening and if there's anything illegal that was taking place? Or how do you view a situation like that? Okay, so the... I read it in the newspaper like everyone else. So on March, Sunday, March 27th of this year, there was an expose by the Gleaner indicating that several uh, credit bureaus and other banks and banks have non-exclusive access, it says, to voter identification card database by electronic means to verify the authenticity of a voter identification card that is presented to them by the owner. And the credit bureaus, they say, pay an agreed fee. And naturally this caused uh, some great consternation because when you look at the voter identification card, it does contain personal information that, that is um, regulated under the law. So the first thing is that it has the name, it has the height of the person, it has date of birth and it has an area, I think, for distinguishing marks. Now those distinguishing marks, so this voter identification card not only contains what we call personal information, but sensitive personal information. The personal information is information that you will use to identify a person, but the sensitive personal information is particularly um, important under the law because it carries with it a higher standard. If there is consent, you will see that you need explicit consent and in writing in relation to sensitive personal data. Sensitive personal data, religious information, political affiliation, height, weight, so that would be phys physio physiological characteristics, characteristics and so on, color of your eyes, um, if you have a scar, um, if your sexual orientation and things like that. And the reason for according a higher degree 
of protection to sensitive personal data is that it has a greater impact on the rights and um, fundamental mm. rights and freedoms of an individual and can cause greater harm or distress. It's important to place on record as well that the Electoral Office of Jamaica denies that they are selling personal information. I've gone through some of the questions, um, well, the answers that they have given to questions raised by the Glena. I really think that the, the answers raise more questions than they have answered. Now, we know that under the Data Protection Act, it prescribes circumstances in which the data for individuals may be processed. Process has a very wide meaning, so that even just by, I mean, this is extreme, almost like looking at the information, one would say that you are processing it because data at rest that is just being stored is being processed. And so it has to be processed in accordance with the standards and the principles inside of the, the law. So the, the law says it has to be lawful, there should be fairness and transparency. There's a, there's a purpose limitation, which means that the data can only be used for the purpose for which it is collected. And perhaps this is where the discussion will take place around whether the, what the Electoral Office of Jamaica has allegedly done um, is in breach or potential breach of the law. You talk about data transfers as, as, as another aspect of how data is to be processed. The data minimization, which means that you don't collect more information than is necessary for what you are going to do. Then there's also the storage limitation that you do not keep the data for longer than is necessary. And of course, there are the data subject access rights. So let's talk about the purpose. So you asked me, is it legal? And um, I, even for myself, I would like to say that the jury is still out. But if I were to look at the matter from the perspective of the functions of the electoral office or what it is set up to do um, for the moment I perhaps I may end up coming down on the fact that they were um, a little bit unaware of what is required of them as data controllers because <clears throat> the electoral office of Jamaica was set up under a statute <clears throat> known as the Electoral Commission Interim Act. And I think that that was in 2016. And that act established the Electoral Commission of Jamaica for the purposes of being a commission of parliament. Now the objects of the commission is set out in that act that it shall be to safeguard the democratic foundations of Jamaica by enabling eligible electors to elect through free and fair elections, their representatives to govern Jamaica. Now right. put, in, put in English, <laughs> that really means that it appears to me on the face of it, you know that we, not just Jamaica, but most democracies have had issues regarding free and fair elections. A component of that would be voter identification. So that when you go further beyond that object, you will see that it has an object there of establishing mechanisms or entities to provide services and product necessary for the identification of persons, the verification of residents. And so a question arises as to whether that role that it has under the law to, to identify persons or to verify persons' residence is one, <clears throat> a, a broad mandate that allows it to share the information in the manner that it says. And I would like to suggest probably not, because when you read a statute, <clears throat> when, it, when persons are permitted to do something or commissions of parliament or statutory bodies are permitted to do something, it is usually within, within the context and the, um, for which and the purposes for which they were set up. So it would seem to me that the identification and verification um, services that it offers under the law should really be associated more with the, um, the purposes for which they were set up, which is uh, free, fair, uh, free and fair elections, exactly. uh, provided right, the identification in that context. Um, I have looked in any event at the, at the question of consent. 
consent being from an individual individual now right so because <clears throat> if one were to argue and i don't think that they could successfully argue that that this allows them to verify information generally then they would have fallen under an exemption in the act mm -hmm. however let us say that there were no exemptions then they would have to be looking at one of the purposes that I just read out to say, particularly on the lawfulness. And it seems to me that they try to hang their hat on um, consent. But with personal information, consent must be explicit, meaning that there must be something that you can point to that the person consented. Whereas on the other hand, in relation to sensitive personal information, which I've described to you, some of the things that are on the identification, you need explicit consent and it must be in writing. Could it be said then that the consent that is given to the banks just simply by handing over your identification card translates into the electoral office of Jamaica giving over that information? And again, I think that the answer to that might very well be no. So what I did in order to test what I'm saying, I remember that these are preliminary preliminary thoughts, right? But right. to test the information in a rudimentary way, what I did is that since I recently and in the past year or so would have applied for some form of credit from the bank, I looked at one of the, 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 the forms that I was given to sign for the credit bureau. And it does not say anywhere there that they would that I would have authorized any verification of my identity by um by the electoral office of Jamaica what I consented to when I signed that albeit reluctantly it says here that the bank hereby gives the customer notice as to the below mentioned matters and by countersigning for the acceptance of this document the customer accepts such notice and it says the bank will treat the customer's information as um, confidential. And it talks about who they will give the information to branches, subsidiaries, representative offices, and so on. And also um, to the credit bureau for um, risk analysis purposes. It says the bank may from time to time give any customer information to the credit bureau or reporting agency, persons with whom the customer may or have or propose to have financial dealings Persons in connection with any dealings a customer has or proposes to have with the bank, the customer agrees that the bank may use all such information to establish and maintain the customer's relationship with the bank and to offer the customer any products or services from time to time. So in that context, it's kind of difficult for me to accept an explanation that says that by giving my identification or any customer for that matter to a bank, then it translates into consent for another controller to hand over inform my information. Mm -hmm. And especially in a context where, as I say, it's sensitive personal information, so written consent is required. And for the persons online, it may not be an ECJ issue, but I would like to suggest that perhaps a best practice issue and the way that I re read the law is that <clears throat> It's individual, it's individual responsibility. So that if I give my information to you, it is for the purpose that I give it to you and anything that is connected with it, with that purpose, anything that is reasonably connected with that person for purpose, because then I actually have a right to know every single place that my information is going to be used for any of the purposes that is stated under the law. So, I mean, that was a mouthful, but, in a nutshell, I'm trying to say that I don't know in any event that by giving consent to one controller that translates into another controller being authorized to give out my information without it being right, being in writing. For the viewers or attendees, then also they have to make a distinction between the requirements for consent in relation to personal information and sensitive personal information. Wow, I did not think that, I want to say you have made it so academic, but that was such a beautiful response to something that was a current affairs issue. And I thank you for how you've broken it down. We do have two questions that came in as you were explaining. I'm gonna start with the first one here. 
if the EOJ verifies by confirming if the information presented by the entity matches theirs, but did not indicate what the EOJ's record says, would that make a difference? But uh, the, the, I, I, I don't know that the act speaks to a little disclosure. <laughs> So that's what that sounds like a little disclosure so because i kept back some and only gave 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 out what you have already consented to i'm not sure because the only other circumstance in which i do recall certainly as, as regards the gdpr where there would be such an exemption is where the information is in the public domain well, sorry where i place the information in the public domain with the electoral office of jamaica we are not I would say providing information to it because I suppose we want to really, it's that if we want to vote and participate in the process, then we go, we register, but it, but it is with the expectation that it will be used for the identification purposes for the elections. It has become commonplace, I actually need to say this because it has become commonplace for banks and other institutions or organizations and businesses to use and treat with that identification as if it were one that authenticates a person and that and that's why i say it's not it, there's no bright bright line that to me is something that we may need to consider because is there room for argument as the electoral office of jamaica says that it is common practice and common knowledge that the identification cards are not just being used as electoral identification cards, but government identification cards. And does that mean that implicitly mm -hmm. we are consenting then to, to, to have the person verify that information? One of the other thoughts that came to me mm -hmm. um, okay. as I was thinking about it, because it requires a lot of thought, is that there is so much identity theft in the United States perhaps because they are more mature than us, um, certainly in relation to the use of identification and in the electronic space. And I wondered whether they had this verification thing in place because if they had that, that uh, optional, what I may call it, or automatic verification in place for government IDs, it seems to me that you would not have so much identity theft, which means that it's not done. So we have to look in order to answer that question, apart from erring on the side of caution and trying to follow as closely as possible what the act says, we may need to err on the side of caution that if we don't see it, see it happening anywhere else, it's likely that it's not permitted. All right, thank you so much for that. As we're wrapping up with Ms. Gibson Henley. Um, Hen Ms. Gibson Henley, um, another question came in. Under the proceeds of Crime Act, financial institutions are required to verify the identity of customers. Jamaica is gray listed due to anti-money laundering weaknesses. So is it that we have to ensure we get consent to verify identity and to access the credit bureau? What would you say to that? Uh, no, because <clears throat> under the Data Protection Act, there are, there are several... <clears throat> lawful basis on which you can get or, or disclose the information. And one of them is if it's being if it's required by law. So the proceeds of crime act, one would readily say that it is to it, it is to, to to comply with a regulatory obligation. The issue though, since I think that's the banker asking it and I'm happy to be talking directly with a banker, is that it's not so much your compliance obligations that you need to watch. It's about that purpose limitation and the data minimization. When the information is collected, it pursuant to compliance with the Proceeds of Crime Act uh, and the requirements and all of the concerns about gray list, banks and other persons who have those regulatory obligations still now need to recognize that you can only use that information for the purposes for which you collected it you can only you can you should only ask for so much information that is necessary to comply with that obligation and then it talks about how long you store that information for so like 
one has to know what and be more um, targeted and intentional about your cross-selling and um, so that it would minimize the amount of text that come unsolicited texts or emails that consumers may complain about yes. once they provided information to the bank. So I'm just saying, watch that as well, that there are other obligations. So you will have a lawful basis, yes, for Seeds of Crime Act, but do remember that that purpose for which you collect the information is always going to be something that the data subject can take you to task on. All right. Miss Georgia Gibson Henling, thank you so much for breaking down that for us. I am sure we all learned quite a bit. And um, we have some questions coming in, but we do have two other attorneys. So I'm just going to ask you for a little bit more of your time as we continue with our Roadmap 2.0 Forum, looking at the Data Protection Act and your business. At this time, I'm going to bring in another attorney, Chuck Mecca Cameron. And Chuck is really going to now break down for us a little bit about what, whether your business is a small, micro, teeny, weeny, medium, large, wherever you are on the spectrum, what is it that is expected of you over the next 12 months to ensure that we're getting compliant with the Data Protection Act? So Chuck, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Amishika. How are you and all the viewers and my fellow panel panelists? Um, we're good. We feel like privacy we're practitioners. We're very happy to be here. <laughs> yes, please. Um, so, so I look at it in two phases. Mm -hmm. There are two big pieces of activities you need to undertake. The first thing is that you need to put yourself in a position to register with the information commissioner. That's step number one. The second step is then to actually implement that privacy framework that's prescribed by the legislation. Um, and one naturally feeds in to the other. So in preparing to register, you're actually doing the groundwork that is necessary to implement that privacy framework that is required by the legislation. So, what does preparing for registration look like? Because that can easily be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. It is not like registering with the registrar of companies. It is not like going on the tax roll. It is not even like going on the marriage roll. Okay. In order to register, the legislation requires that you provide some very basic information to the information commissioner. She wants to know what personal data or category of personal data are you processing? What category of data subjects, personal data are you processing? Who are you sharing this personal data with? And what are the general controls you have put in place to protect this personal data that you're processing? So while at the end, so that is what will inform the registration particulars, in addition to, as we heard commissioners speak to, identifying a data controller, identifying a data processor. However, to elicit or uncover that information is a very involved process. Um, the first thing we need to do, we need to understand what personal data is. Mm -hmm. And so as you, we, we even learned there's personal data and sensitive personal data. <laughs> remember we spoke about categories of personal data, correct. What is personal data? So are you processing or per, is PSOJ processing our personal data now? Yes, they are processing our, our faces. They are processing our voices and we have or names on the screen as well. So from a PSO perspective, you have to identify what are the processes that PSOJ undertakes in their day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. One of the things is as advocacy to action. And in the middle of that is sensitization and awareness. 
So this would be one of your sensitization awareness processes. And you are collecting personal data from us. You are collecting personal data from your participants, everybody that had to register. So you would have to know, you'd have had to know that we collect video recordings of those of our participants. You'd have had to know that you'd have had to declare that you're also collecting the audio, the voices of the participants. Everything that you collected, you'd have to be able to identify. Then the information commissioner wants to know, well, before you do that, you need to know if you are sharing that information with anybody. So right now, you are sharing all of our information with some, somebody in foreign. You are exporting our information across borders. Mm -hmm. Zoom does not reside in Jamaica. Zoom head office is in one country and the servers that are processing this personal data resides in a specific country. Those cloud servers reside in those specific countries. You need to be able to tell the information commissioner where those servers are. You need to declare to her on registration that you are process this, we are processing this data and these are the persons that you are sharing the data with. Then she's going to want to know, okay, what are the controls you have put in place to ensure my privacy and your privacy, I'm Anashika, you enjoy privacy rights as well. What controls has PSOJ and Chris, who is the head of the technology and the innovation committee, put in place to ensure that our privacy rights are not breached? So do you have a data processing agreement with Zoom? Is, is our data now encrypted when we're sending it across the internet? Do you, what controls have you put in place to protect our rights? So that's what the information commissioner wants to know. So I've just given you a very, 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 very basic, simple contemplation of what you need to be thinking about. One, you need to be able to identify all the personal data. Are you now storing my my IP address when to connect to the Zoom link? Is that IP address being shared? So this is there's nothing intuitive in that. One of the reasons why Georgia has all those letters behind her name that she was explaining. And one of the reasons I don't, my name is long enough, so I don't usually put any letters behind my name. Um, but one of the reasons why I would have gone down the international, the ISO route and done the European certification is so we can be able to efficiently assist our clients in identity one, training them and making, aware, making them aware that yes, PSOJ, right now you are processing personal data. Mm -hmm. Yes, our clients, you, when, when somebody walks into your organization, and that security guard captures your license plate number and name. When the CCTV captures a face, yes, those are all processes that you need to contemplate that process personal data. The information commissioner does want to know what to do with that, your, the name and the license plate number you collect in a security guard. What happens to that book? So it is a step that from experience, Dependent on the size of the organization, the whole concept of getting ready for registration takes upwards of 12 months. As I said, it's not like registering with the information with the registrar of companies. Having done. But what I'm getting yeah. to say though is a matter of documenting all of your processes, how you're interfacing with your clients, whether it's online, via telephone, or whether they walk through the door, documenting all of those processes would be a start. Correct. Well, the, the, the difference with information security and cyber security and data protection, data protection is all about compliance. How do we help you comply with the standards and the prerequisites prescribed by the legislation so that when the information commissioner conducts her assessment, that's a very friendly term that is set out in the legislation, when she conducts her legislation, 
you need to be able to have documented proof of these things. So interestingly, and this is one of the questions asked was, could we use an overseas um, DPO? Interestingly, under the GDPR in Europe, you're not required to file what we call registration particulars. You're only required to maintain them internally. So unless the ICO conducts an investigation, you may never even have cause to present your registration particulars. In Europe, they call it the record of processing. In Jamaica, from the get-go, everyone must file one. So it, it, it is is and that is because we're starting from scratch okay so remember we have two years and right now we're in the, the end of the first quarter has ended that's and i'm suggesting the fastest we have done it is in 10 months you now have to roll out the date the data protection compliance framework we heard about the information commissioner speaking about ensuring the data controller is in a position to enable the exercise of rights by the data subjects. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. If a data subject walks through the front door and goes to the receptionist or stands outside and speaks to the security guard at the door and say, I would, gives him a note, I would like all the information, I would like to know all the information you're processing of me and I want you to give me all of that information. That security guard, that receptionist must be able to look at it and know what that is. That means she needs to know that this is a data subject access request. And if we don't reply to this in 30 days, I would be in breach of the law. So she now needs to know who do I give this to, to action. So you must build out a process to ensure that you can deliver to that data subject the request within the 30 days. And that's an entire process that has to be built out in terms of validating who the data subject is because you don't want to be giving personal data to a third party without any authorization or giving it to the wrong person and thereby breaching their rights. So mm -hmm. putting a system, that's one, that's one right that we're enabling. What systems do we have in place to ensure that we maintain the accuracy of the personal data that we're processing? If there is a breach, when, and I don't use the word if, when there is a breach, and if the information commissioner comes in and conducts an assessment, she wants to see that you have a system in place to ensure that the personal data that you are processing is accurate and maintained is the question not, isn't necessarily is all the information you have accurate no what is a system that you have implemented mm -hmm. that has been documented and implemented and your staff members are aware of that provides it so when we speak about the, the privacy framework it is ensuring that all the prescriptions of the legislation in terms of encryption, your vulnerability testing, well, your testing, your business continuity planning that has to be in place, all of those things are documented and be, you are in a position to demonstrate it, but you also need to ensure your systems are in place to demonstrably prove to the information commissioner that you have enabled and respect the right of privacy of your plans. All right. So that, and that is that is not a one year process either. I, I mean, listen, you again, we're breaking down with examples and you're really walking us through how sensitive this is, whether we think the information is too sensitive or not, but how, as you say, how is it that we're documenting the information, the accuracy of it? And if the person said, hey, I want to know what you have on me, we have a responsibility to be able to provide that information as well. A question came in, Chuck, as you were speaking. I'm just going to pull it up. Uh, a little bit of a mouthful here, but let me get to it. For what it's worth, is the authority of the information commissioner circumscribed to the electronic processing of data only? Or if an SME 
has a big book with written down PII is that hardback book and the internal processes that govern that book in scope of the Data Protection Act. Would that be a question for you or to Ms. Barclay? Well, we, we, we all get the same information from the legislation and the practice. And that's an easy question. The answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes. And I made in, in my example, I made reference mm. to that security guard who has that big book in his shed that writes down your license plate number and the time you come in. You need to be in a position to know whether or not that book, well, how long are you keeping that information? How do you ensure the accuracy of that information is correct? It, does that book reside within your organization or is it shared with the third party security oh, organization you. that is providing the service? Remember, we're speaking about the rights to privacy and that you and I enjoy. So there's no limitation for, from a business perspective. If it is, you put the data subject at the center of your considerations and ask yourself the question, am I respecting the right to privacy of the individual? It doesn't matter if it's in a electronic format, digital format or hard copy, you need to be accountable for it. So another thing that's coming up to the fore is as a regular businesses, we will also have to rewrite some of the contracts we have with third party suppliers, whether it's even just a decor company that's coming in to do something, as you mentioned with the security guard, the company that I hired him through, if they will have access to that book that logs license plate and that sort of thing. So I see quite a bit of work, as you say, fast as you've ever done it was in 10 months, but a lot of things will have to be rewritten along this um, path as well. Um, I'm Amashika, rewriting it is the easy part. It is going through the business re process, re-engineering, identifying that personal data, mapping the flow of that data, engaging your stakeholders, training your staff, putting your privacy notice together, and then we can start talk about rewriting because the rewriting comes in at the end after you have done that initial establishment of your registration particulars in terms of knowing what personal data you are processing and knowing who you're sharing it with and knowing what happens to it. You can't rewrite anything Thing if you don't know what personal data you have. All right, one more coming into you here. What about if data aggregate? What about if a data aggregator or a citizen gleans the PII that the subject has themselves put in the public domain? Example, online phone directories. So as you'd have heard Georgia speak to, that is one exemption from under the Data Protection Act where a data subject willfully and intentionally places hints information in the public domain, that, that can be deemed as a basis upon which you can process that data. And remember, there are at least seven other data processing standards that you have to comply with. So not because you can now put it in your CRM because he put it in the public space means that this is good, no you still have to account to him and let him know, you know what, I now have your data and I am processing it. This is how long I'm keeping it. This is why I captured your data and this is how I'm protecting it. So not because you have the, a lawful basis to store it means that that's the end of the job. The data, the, the, and I want to change the discussion around how the data protection that works. If we are really making this transition to this digital, well, doing the digital transition, what the Data Protection Act really does, you know, if you are to follow the data processing standards to the T, it really is a roadmap as to what, are, what, is, what does a digital transition 101 look like? What are some of the basics that I can put in place to, to create the most efficient process? Because right now there are, there are banks, law firms that have rooms and floors and trailers worth of papers. 
containing personal data that if they were to apply the law, more than likely they don't have no lawful basis for keeping it for any extended period of time. So if it is you are to apply or conform with the data processing standards, you would immediately, while there are some upfront costs that you will incur, you would very quickly start to see some operational efficiencies and reduction of operational costs. You're on mute, I'm, I'm Ashika. Solid response there, Chuck. Um, if there are no other questions for Chuck, we're going to take our final attorney for the morning. Um, all right. So thank you so much, Chuck, for framing that out for me there. Quite a bit of work that our entities would have to do, whether you're micro, small, medium, or large. It's important for you to start looking at the processes, how you're actually collecting information, how you're interacting with your clients online via another medium or even in person. And then contact one of our attorneys to help us go through this process of really becoming compliant because it's not going and to be a very short process. But thank you so much to you, Chuck. All right. I am now going to invite our next attorney, Miss Samantha Grant. And in terms of bringing in Samantha, I, I wanted us to kind of look at a little bit of, you know, we're not the first place to have a data protection act. It has been out there in other jurisdictions. We heard about the GDPR. And so I just wanted Samantha to give us a little bit of an update as to what's happening elsewhere. What are some things we should be contemplating or some guidelines? Um, so Sam, Good morning and welcome to you. Good morning, Amashika. Thank you for having me. Good morning, all. Good morning, presenters, panelists, and the attendees, of course. Mm -hmm. Sam, give me a little bit of an update. What has been happening that we can learn from as we go forward? Well, in looking at other jurisdictions, um, I focused on how the big the big question of liability so the question regarding how litigation works um, under the data protection act um, how the rights have been enforced and um, the role of the information commissioner um, in court um, and her role um, in isolation and her role um, in in terms of bringing an action or an appeal um, of a determination of the information commissioner um, to the court. So specifically what I noticed across jurisdictions because there are over 120 countries that have data privacy laws, but there are fewer countries that have very similar um, data protection frameworks. And as you know, the Jamaican Data Protection Act is largely following the UK GDPR. Mm -hmm. So in looking at that, I focus more on the case law there. And what I generally took away was the fact that the data protection standards first are very general terms. So you have general terms such as not processing or keeping data for um, longer than is necessary. You have general terms such as the purpose um, purpose limitation, the, minim the data minimiz minimization um, question. And so these, where you have these gray areas or um, areas that are open to interpretation, you have a court action. So you see where there are issues um, when you don't understand the, the, how the act actually works. And those issues include a failure to understand the role of the information commissioner. So you have cases where data, data subjects seeing a breach of the Data Protection Act and immediately goes to court, but fails. Fails, why? They fail because they did not go to the information commissioner, so they're not able to, they're in court and unable to prove damage. They're unable to prove um, that, their, their connection with that breach. So that is why it's very important to understand the information commissioner and making a report to the information commissioner versus going straight to courts to bring an action against a data controller. 
because not all rights and obligations under the act would result in you suffering some damage and there, thereby bringing a court action. So I would like to point us specifically in that case, um, Lloyd and Google LLC, that's a 2021 case that is, if you Google it, it's probably the first case that you'll ever you see under this area where it was a class action that was brought against Google, but the first, it was not brought beyond the application to serve outside the jurisdiction. Why? Because they were not able to, they were not able to establish to the court that they had a real prospect of success. And in doing so, that is you basically exposing your claim in a very, in a more concise way to, to, to satisfy the court that they should grant this order, which is something that will come up a lot here because we have a lot of data controllers that process data within the jurisdiction, but they themselves are outside the jurisdiction as we would have heard before. So in that case, they were unable to prove that yes, their data, they, their rights under the act was breached, but they were unable to prove that they suffered damage on an individual basis, although it was a class action case. That is one example. Another example is somebody not understanding the full capacity of the Data Protection Act in a circumstance, again, where a data controller is outside the jurisdiction. And here I want to bring us back, bring our attention back to the fact that where you are a data controller that is not within the jurisdiction, you are required to appoint a representative within the jurisdiction. Now, what that means is not the fact that this representative will replace you in a court action. The representative is not the data controller for the purposes of liability under the act. So what I've also seen is, um, are cases where persons brought actions against a representative within the country versus the data controller, data controllers themselves. And, not, and that's it. I can give you an example of that case, and that is Rondon and LexisNexis Risk Solutions. So in Jamaica, we will have data controllers that are outside the jurisdictions, and you may have a lot of persons offering services, um, representative services, which really only acts as a conduit or a um, postal address um, for the purposes of um, compliance with the act. So this representative is very, very different from a data protection officer. And so the liability in terms of that person or that company or that body would be very different from that of the data controller. What I also see um, in case law being developed in other countries um, is a lack of um, understanding where, with the rights and obligations, the exemptions permitted under the Act, and also exemptions permitted by other Acts. And I think um, Mrs. Gibson Henning QC had touched on that, and Mr. Cameron as well, in relation to um, exemptions um, provided by statute, such as POCA or the Access to Information Act. And so that is a very, that's a first defense that um, a data controller can and will draw for when a data subject brings an action against them in court. Now, um, us be, um, we're in the PSOJ forum. So we are largely dealing with data controllers. Now your exposure to liability. When you're looking at the representative, you're looking at somebody within the jurisdiction that is able to receive um, complaints, um, receive requests, receive service of documents um, under the in relation to the act, but that is also of itself a nuanced area as um, that is also a gray area that is uh, that was also dealt with in the UK jurisdiction where they stated that the qualifications for service are, is only limited um, to a, an action brought under the Data Protection Act. So the case law there is developing and it's, you will need somebody, you will need an attorney 
to really dive through the exemptions and how it relates to you. And in looking at the exemptions, each data, each data controller really does need not only an attorney, but you need an attorney on your team. Why you want to capitalize on the, your ability to process data under the act while staying within the, the exemption. So you don't want it to be where you are not doing all that you can do under the act, but you don't want it to also be that you are breaching or um, incorrectly relying on an exemption. Why? Mrs. Hending touched on it earlier, the very important and underlying reason of the purpose limitation. And that is something that will give rise to a lot of litigation. The question of whether you are processing and collecting data in accordance with the purpose for which you communicated um, to the data subject. And that is a very, very, very large area of litigation um, under the UK, the UK laws. You um, think that being something that's going to come up quite a bit for us as well? Right, right, right. So I go. I just want to pose it to you here. Um, what are your thoughts on the recent, um, you know, mail pack aeropost breach and massive cyber attack? What do you think the outcome will be? And if you have any advice to some of the customers and if that feel like their data was compromised, is there? Can you comment publicly in this way on something like this, or is well, there a way you can comment on something? Well, I'm going to keep my um, comments very general because I must admit that I am unaware of the specifics of the case, but things to look out for. The first thing before you decide that you want to bring an action is to identify whether you have suffered some damage and the breach itself is not you suffering damage under the act. So if you're able to identify this damage caused to you, for example, if a data controller kept data longer than is necessary and then transfers this data and that results in some damage to, to you um, monetarily, then that's an easy way to identify damage done to you. Now, I would say that's the first thing that you should think about whether there was some damage in relation to you. And um, that's of course in the context of bringing an action directly in, in front of the court. Now, um, in relation to the information commissioner, understanding her role differently, once there's a breach, you report it. That's different from the role you going directly to the court. So understanding the role of in, the information commissioner will save you a lot of money. So report it to the information commissioner. The information commissioner has a wide array of powers, including issuing different notices, such as the enforcement notice, the assessment notice, um, order um, search, searching powers, inspection powers. And so the, the information notices, et cetera. And so her powers or in her exercising her powers, you may very well get the um, remedy for which you seek. Now, so that would be my um, brief advice in relation to that. All right, and, and I, I know a couple of friends of mine would have received a notice. So would you say that now that we have the DPA um, you know, coming on stream, more companies are seeing it as important to inform their customers when breaches occur as well? Right. So the based on the, the, the requirements of the act and its obligations on the data controller, right? The the obligations there under would provide more um, protections for the data subjects, including informing them of their when their data has been processed, when there's a breach. But the note I must note that the 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 notification of the breach not on, is not only in relation to the information commissioner, but also the data subjects. So that is also a right that is guaranteed by the act. And so persons being aware of this right can then be aware of um, 
any liability that 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 um flows there from all right well sam mantha grant from the well i didn't introduce you properly but you're an associate at the duncox law firm thank you so much for providing some insight there if there are no further questions for samantha or any exist or any other existing one i will invite my chair of the innovation and digital transformation committee okay one more question in some instances, it may, be, it may be necessary to report a data breach to both the police and the Office of the Information Commissioner, especially if the data breach involves the Cyber Crimes Act. So well, this is not a question, but um, I don't know if our Information Commissioner would like to respond on that. Or if, oh, well, I see Ms. Gibson Henlin raised her hand. I'm not sure if it's in relation to this one. No, it's not in relation to this one, but it was just to add, uh, um, add something to what um, Samantha was presenting on for for the for your audience. One of the things that they would want to know is the difference between an incident and a breach, because not every incident is a breach, even though all breaches are incidents. So what you are required to report are breaches. And you, you, you will get to the, to, to, to the point of determining that it is a breach if the rights and um, freedoms of the, that are protected of the data subject are, are, are likely to be at risk. And that is why you will hear throughout your data protection compliance program, one of the significant things that you will need to have is an incident response plan. I would just thought I would add that to that discussion. It's very valuable. Definitely something we're making note of, the incident response plan. All right, and on that note, I do want to say thank you for staying on board with us this entire time. I'm going to invite the chair of our Innovation and Digital Transformation Committee to come and do the closing, but there is a quick call that we'd like our attendees to um, respond to if they can. I'll just give you like a minute and a half respond to three questions as we invite Chris to wrap up. It has been such a lovely morning information film, but this is the way we walk into the weekend, hyped, energized, and learning. <laughs> All right. And if there are any additional questions that any of the attendees have, you can please post it and we will get a response to you. We will also be circulating a one page of breaking down some of the important points that were raised by all of our panelists today. All right, so just gonna give you 30 more seconds to finish up on that poll. And then I close out with my committee here. Chris, how are you feeling? I am feeling informed and educated, man. With all of these folks, all your letters behind your name, I feel like I need to go back to school. <laughs> Meg, man, Chuck, I don't know, Chuck is right. He's, um. His name is long enough, he can't put all of those. Uh, but, but guess what? If you go to his Instagram page, you'll see all of your certifications that have been popping up over the last few <laughs> or the last few months. Um, folks, look, thank you very, very, very much. Um, thanks for all the 80 plus uh, folks we had join us, members of the PSOJ and, and, and other attendees. Thank you very, very much. Um, Madam Commissioner, thank you very much for your, 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 your information and the way you delivered it as always. Um, you know, I will, I will share, you know, and I'm not going to share in a joke or anything, but one of the first times that we we're going to do an event with the commissioner, the commissioner was, you know, you know she didn't, she said, no, guys, I'm, this is not me. Um, this is not something that I enjoy doing. And then the lady just took the stage and took over the place and she was just a superstar. So, of course, one of our producers came to her and said, you are a fraud. You said that you didn't like doing this, but you are natural at this. You just delivered on every question. You're just so eloquent. So, Commissioner Celia Barkley, thank you very, very, very much for. It's a um, record. I will <laughs> never forgive you for that. <laughs> As always, there is so much more work to do, ladies and gentlemen. There is so much to do. Um, you know, Chuck, uh, attor well, all attorneys uh, that, that are with us, um, Meg, Chuck, and Sam. Uh, thanks for your insights. One of the things I said, and, and look, I am a son of a lawyer and I'm a husband of a lawyer. So legal surrounds me, right? Surrounds me. And one of the things I messaged, I messaged to um, Amashika, I said, Amma, we cannot have four lawyers here and we're only booked an hour. I said, lawyer, love, talk. I know that from experience. 
right? I grew up in a house. So the gray here is over 50 years old. So folks, uh, we do we do understand and appreciate that there's a lot more questions and there may be another time that we may have to extend this in a different version and different form, maybe back in person when we go there. But um, it's been a, a wonderful set of information that was um, shared. I mean, I made some notes, you know, to myself around, you know, Chuck spoke about putting systems in place to, un to, to ensure that if someone turns up to your organization, you know, whether it's a former employer, employee, whether it's a sorry, former, former employee, customer, and would like to know what information that you have on them, we have to have systems in place to uh, be prepared to deliver that. Um, I love what Meg said a while ago um, when she jumped in at the last part to say, look, uh, incidents versus breaches. Not all incidents are breaches, but all breaches are incidents. And we have to learn how to figure out how to um, handle that. And, and, and I love Sam jumping into some of the, case, uh, the, 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 the cases that she brought up. So folks, there's a lot more to learn on this. Um, myself and Chuck have been on the circuit doing a fair amount of, a fair amount of, um, uh, I, I guess, okay. synthesization and education around. We, we have to ensure that people really and truly understand uh, what's happening out there and the timing. And of course, um, uh, the commissioner also, she had a session just recently with the PSOJ, over 100 and I think 40 uh, members, you know, companies were traded on the public. So she's on a, a mission to educate and inform. Um, yes, Meg, you had a, uh, you had your hand up. Right. Um, someone is indicating that we did not answer one of the questions. The question in some instances, it may be necessary to um, report to the information commission, to the police and the Office of Information Commissioner, especially if the data breach involves the Cyber Crimes Act. I could hazard a guess on that if you if you permit me. Well, I mean, well, go ahead. Um, I, I think when Amma read it, she wasn't sure if it, was a, it was a question or a statement. And I think some... it read more of a statement saying just inform that in some instances, um, oh no, the question that person wanted answering was about the medical field. That's what the, the, oh, the medical field. So there was a question about the medical field. I did read it. It came from somebody in the in the medical fraternity. That's and I'll go back up, I'll go back up and read it. Let me go, it's way up. Um oh, the medical field. If your doctor yes. gives you a referral form to get blood tests done, does the lab have the right to provide your results to the doctor? That's a question. And then what does the lab do to protect itself? Hmm. Who wants to put up their hand and, and jump on that fast? Because I when, must depart here for a 12 o'clock meeting. <laughs> when, when the doctor requests the lab to, to, to perform the test, the, the, lab, the doctor is acting on your behalf, basically as your agent, because you have gone there, the doctor signs, you then go in and remember that you signed that form and it asks on that lab form, to whom should it be sent? And you can decide if you're sending it to your general practitioner, your specialist, and so on. So that's a short answer. They must yes. I must still be the focus, the subject, the, the primary data subject. I must still be the focus. All righty. Right. Um, you know, that's an interesting question because when I read it initially, I, I thought to myself, uh, as a justice of the peace, I get requests to verify people's addresses, I get requests. And so uh, myself and a, and a few attorneys, um, and, and Chuck was one of them that we debated over the discussion that, um, and, and the thoughts that uh, Georgia shared earlier with respect to that um, question that I had asked uh, around EOJ. And I argued um, you know, against, against Chuck's point, um, you know, just, for, just to be open and to, to share different ideas that, you know, it's it's whilst they whilst that specific identification and the process was provided for uh, voting, uh, many government organizations have now said that it's okay to be used as an ID. And so when I've been asked to write letters as a justice of the peace to say that this person lives at that address, that is a proof that they bring. They have no other proof, right? The the passport doesn't say where the person lives. Um, they have no driver's license. And so if this is being used as an ID, and then in its use as an ID, you need to verify it. That's where I kind of got a little bit, hmm, is this really against the law? Or 
as was said by some uh, a team member, uh, one of the panelists, is it that the uh, controller does not understand the full letter of what they're responsible for? As a Sam putting up her hand to weigh in on this, again, let's try to keep it brief. I need to, I need to disappear <laughs> from my 12 o'clock, but Sam, go ahead. Right, um, I had a burning comment in relation to the question regarding the EOJ. Um, yeah. is, um, also recall the obligations of verification under the POCA um, Act. And so this is just a preliminary point. You can explore um, whether this would fall under the, um, the, the obligations under a statutory obligation under the POCA Act. Okay. You know, I'm a, as, 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 as I'm listening to the, the questions here and I'm seeing um, more, more comments popping up in, in, in the chat, one of the things I think we may have to do is after this discussion here, we may have to extend this online. And look, guys, Jamaica Digital Society, Innovation and Digital, Com and Digital Transformation Committee, we may have to open a, a Twitter spaces and continue this discussion another time. So I'm a, um, let's ideate around it. Let's uh, get the panelists, panelists um, approval. Let's see if we could just have one evening. Um, yes, we need to promote it to let people come back and, and join in the discussion, but it may, it, it may be something that we extend outside of just um, our forum here um, as, as, as an extension. So it's just an idea. But ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you so much. very, very much um, for being here. I think uh, I mean, I'm looking at all the questions here and I'm like, you know, taking notes, a lot of great questions, a lot of great scenarios. And I'm, 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 I'm thanking the esteemed panel here for their discussions and debate. And of course, our uh, commissioner, um, thank you very, very much. And um, thank you for the work that you do. Amma, over to you. All right, I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone. We did see a question come in asking if it's going to be up on our YouTube page and I will let you know, yes, it will. We're also going to take on board our chairman's um, suggestion to do a Twitter spaces. So if you all are on Twitter, you can let me know. We can have a conversation offline because we do want to continue to sensitize people. And the PSOJ is a thought leader in many areas, and this is one of them. Hence, we do have a committee that focuses on same. Today was just an absolute pleasure. Chris Record to Miss Gibson Henling to Samantha Grant to. Kwameka Cameron, to Ms. Celia Barclay, as well as to our sponsor, JMMB. I want to say thank you so much and enjoy the rest of